people of the United States. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Hello, and welcome to George Washington Slept Here, the civic education podcast from Freedom's Foundation at Valley Forge, where we explore American history, civics, and the idea of liberty through conversations with some of our favorite thinkers, writers, and leaders. I'm Jason Rea, Chief Operating Officer at Freedom's Foundation and host of George Washington Slept Here. The format is simple, a long-form conversation with a friend of Freedom's Foundation where everyone can learn something new. Before we begin, we encourage everyone to subscribe to George Washington Slept Here wherever you listen to your podcasts and make sure you get every new episode as soon as it's out. We love hearing from our listeners, so please email us at gwshpodcast at gmail.com with your comments, questions, or suggestions. Today's interview is with George Boudreau, public historian and editor of Women in George Washington's World, which just came out last year. Hello, George. Hello. Our conversation today is going to be structured in a way to keep us on track. We want to explore your origin story. How did you become the person sitting here before us? And your current work as a teacher and writer of early American history. And then I want to talk about the state of America today. Finally, we will end with a quiz, which hopefully will allow listeners to learn a little something extra about you. So, George, tell us, where were you born and raised? I am from Michigan City, Indiana, which is in the northwestern corner of the state. Uh, overlooking Lake Michigan and and Chicago on the other side of the water. Okay, excellent. And who were your early influences? Who were the people who sort of pushed you to become Dr. George Boudreaux? I suppose my family. My grandmother was a second grade teacher, and my grandfather was a Virginian and quite a storyteller, and both pushed that. Uh, Dad was a a very patriotic World War II veteran, uh, and so we always had history as a part of that, loading the kids into the green Chevy station wagon and driving to historic sites around the country. And I was fascinated by that. And very early, I got interested in the history of the White House and the presidency. And they were very indulgent in that. So a lot of trips to president sites and, uh, and, and getting to do that. Great. Uh, so that, things are starting to make sense. Uh, I'm understanding uh, where your uh, writing and, and your research, uh, how that connects. You went to Manchester College and Indiana University. So mm-hmm. early on, you're really, you know, the Midwest through and through. So I'm curious, uh, how did you wind up in Philadelphia, which has become really part and parcel with your career now? I was uh, fascinated by Philadelphia history. I I studied under a great fellow named Paul Lucas at Indiana, who was a colonial historian, but very into New England and the Connecticut River Valley. And I wanted to do something else. I grew very tired of talking about Puritan theology. Um, That a little goes a long way. And I became fascinated with uh, Quaker Pennsylvania and the work done there. Um, Two historians really drew me to do that, a a woman named Mary Maples Dunn, uh, who went on to be uh, a dean at Bryn Mawr and then the president of Smith College, and who edited the papers of William Penn with her husband, Richard S. Dunn, and Gary Nash, who was an early pioneering leader of social history, and how do we look at the roles of the poor and working people in uh, the life of the colony. And it was vastly different. The story of early Pennsylvania and early Massachusetts are vastly different. So it was something new and different and a little bit radical, I think. I, I think my graduate committee all thought I was a little bit mad. And uh, I was a very poor grad student, but uh, but came here, you know, saved my pennies and came out uh, starting in the early 90s. I guess in 91, I did my first research trip to Philadelphia and did them again, you know, sort of for three to four weeks at a time, working in the different archives. And uh, in 94, I was well into starting my dissertation and applied for a series of grants. There were several organizations that funded you for a month or in one case for 10 months to write and do research. And I remember my advisor, who was a good friend, but um, maybe a bit more uh, cynical than I was saying, oh, you're never going to win these. You're, n- there's no way you're going to ever win one of these prizes. It's a waste of time. And I won all four. Oh, wow. Um, which I th- I've i been told I broke the system because after that they changed the rules that you weren't allowed to. 
but got funding from the David Library of the American Revolution. Sure, which is now part of APS. That is. The, We're going to talk about later. Yeah, the American Philosophical Society now. And uh, the Library Company in Philadelphia, founded by Franklin in th 1731. The Historical Society, uh, um, uh, the American Philosophical Society, f uh, founded by Franklin in 1743. Uh, and then what is now the McNeil Center for Early American Studies at Penn where they gave me 10 months. So I said, I, I've always said I moved to Philadelphia to stay for 10 months, and it's now been almost 30 years. Wow. And as soon as I get everything done, I'm going to go <laughs> going back, back to, to Indiana. Indiana. And, uh, no. <laughs> There's a lot of songs about going back to Indiana. Nobody ever actually moves back there, yeah. except for Dan Quayle. No. I think that's true of New Jersey as well. Anyway, so, okay, so you wind up here uh, in, in this sort of twin, because you're, you're doing your uh, dissertation work and uh, your graduate study, but also um, there is, uh, and they're certainly interrelated, but there is this, this deep abiding connection to the history of the era and what was happening mm -hmm. in Philadelphia, what had happened in Philadelphia. So I, I want to start with, this um, uh, this question of public history. Um, you on your website when you introduce yourself to people, you talk about yourself as a public historian, and and uh, to my recollection, that's only something I started hearing uh, more widely used in in maybe the last five years or so. Oh, wow. Um, and and so, but I think it's a great distinction between those who are in a university doing research, you know, writing and not to say it that, but, but it's a different role than teaching. Uh, and though you do both, but tell us the difference. Tell us what a public historian is versus what we think of as just a, a regular old well, historian. The, the term goes, goes back a lot later than five years. It's, I, 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 the first time I would use, I'd have to look that up or go to the website of the National Council for Public History. I know the MCPH has a definition there. It was sometimes at the first called applied history. Mm -hmm. There were folks who were going to, you know, be in a traditional college classroom and teach and maybe publish and uh, grade papers. And applied history or public history was more geared towards reaching an audience in other venues. Historic house museums, national parks, uh, uh, battlefields, uh, and a, a variety of other things. Uh, publishing, working with different organizations, uh, broadcasting now, documentary editing, um, documents publishing. So uh, this all, public history can take all kinds of, of avenues. I was very lucky when I moved here. I guess sometime in 94... I very quickly learned that my research on Franklin and on early Philadelphia was very relevant to historic sites near where I was. And I soon began our, uh, or volunteering with the National Park Service at Independence National Park downtown in Philadelphia and other sites in the area that you needed, you know, historical work done. What, you know, how do we figure this out or what are we doing with this? Uh, I, I think within my first year, I was teaching sections for their, their summer teachers workshop and and worked with them and then got involved in other ways um, pretty quickly uh, after I my McNeil Center fellowship ran out and I won another prize from what's called the Spencer Foundation, which awards money for the history and study of education. I was pondering what to do and uh, a friend who was with the National Park Service recommended that I apply to run and live in the Powell House, a mansion in Society Hill, Philadelphia, which was great. It was a wonderful building and had an amazing story about the man and particularly the woman who had lived there. But it also had a lot of needs. They uh, they had had some fundraising problems and they'd been closed for a while. And I learned a lot about historic site management sort of on the ground running. And the, the excitement for me was I was always fascinated in how surviving stuff, materials, paintings, furniture can tell us about the past. They had done a microscopic analysis of the original painted surfaces in the house done by a scientist named Matthew Mosca, who had just finished doing George Washington's Mount Vernon before he studied the surfaces in the Powell House. And when I got there, these were in these three ring binders, massive amounts of data, but you know, of no relevance, no one was ever gonna see them. And I reorganized a guides group and worked with fundraising, and we restored all the painted surfaces of the Powell House. 
So I, as I've joked many times in the past, I learned more about the history of the painted Venetian blind than any human being <laughs> could want to know. But I could pick out exactly the color uh, of green paint that was on Samuel Powell's Venetian blinds and, and others, it turned out. And it was exciting. And I loved working with the public. So um, we were, that's really the connection. Yeah. It's that public piece of yeah. it. You're not just sitting in a research library, though that might be part of what you're doing. But it, it is very much the intersection with the public. And certainly history has become ever more popular. There were some real popularizers, the Chernows and the, you yeah. know, the, those other biographies that came out around early 2000. That, of, but it's now there's there is this real hunger on, on behalf of the public to better understand history. One of my fun days at work was uh, uh, an organizer of a, another organization called me one day and said, a man named David McCullough wants to see the Powell House. And I said, you're kidding. And, sh and she said, do you know him? And I said, well, you know, I'm a historian. Of course I know who David McCullough is. But I had lunch for them in the Powell House garden and then took them on a walk. And uh, I don't know if you ever got to talk to David McCullough, but I joked with him at lunch that day that I would let I would listen to him read the phone book. Uh, I had, absolutely I'd come to him or come to know him from his, the Ken Burns Civil War series. And David had the most beautiful uh, speaking voice and lovely in conversation. And one of the great things about getting to sit down in my garden, where I lived at the Powell House at the time too, and was sit down with them was he was as inquisitive as a smart child. His eyes were bright. He was fascinated. You know, he said to me, I remember, he was he, he was debating what the next topic of his book was going to be. And it, at that point, it was still a dual biography of Jefferson and Adams. And he said at that lunch, I'm really thinking I'm going to write a book on John Adams. Mm -hmm. And I said, we really need a great new book on John Adams. Amen Do to it. that. And John Adams had very famously um, dined with Samuel and Elizabeth Powell in September of 1774. And John Adams liked food. I know that's hard to believe when you look at his portraits, but he wrote about every dish, every type of cheese, all four kinds of alcohol that he had that day. And David said to me, uh, what kind of wine did Adams drink? And I said, well, he drank Madeira. And he said, have you ever had it? Do you know what it tastes like? And I'm like, well, would you like some? So I went and got the, the Powell House commemorative stemware, and we sat in the garden sipping Madeira, which was quite, you know. Oh, uh, what fun. Yeah. You know, they, they were, they, you know, uh, I, I was honored to get to meet him a few times. But So I so you really led us to uh, where I want to turn next, which is um, the connection between place and in, in history and why place is important and why being there, standing where something happened 200, 250 years before is somehow more real. What, what is, mm -hmm. and, and, and so much of what you have done, and we're going to get to your book, um, Independence, which is all about place, but why is place so important to better understanding history? I, I may be, it may be because I'm not very bright, but uh, I've always said I can't write about something I can't walk through. I think place is incredibly important. I, uh, you know, no matter what I'm writing about, I tend to try to go there. My, you know, my work with independence grew out of a controversial period in the history of the historic district there and fights over what would happen with the site of George and, George and Martha Washington's Philadelphia home and the enslaved people who they kept there, they kept in bondage there. And I said... My argument was just tell the story, but you know, you just j j don't, you know. As, as I said to the Freedoms Foundation's teachers' workshop, show me anywhere in history that George Washington said, "Please don't mention that I enslaved people." You know, it just doesn't happen. He wasn't hiding it. If you look at any picture of early Mount Vernon, there are enslaved workers on the lawn. It's it's it is the re it is reality. No one's asking us to cover this up. So I, I get very deeply into this, and that's one of the reasons I write about Philadelphia as I do and a few other places. And my next project is all about places, and um, both here and in London, I've spent a lot of time just walking. You know, I've, I've walked up and down the streets trying to figure out where young Benjamin Franklin was and, uh, and also his home at Craven Street. The only surviving Benjamin Franklin house in the world is in London, so... I think it's it's vastly important to know that you're treading on the stairs, touching the same railing. Maybe I, you know I try not to sit in colonial chairs, but um, 
you know, I think it's in incredibly evocative and it make, it connects us into a, a bigger picture. Yeah, ab absolutely. I think there is, uh, there's that physical connection when they're, when you're in a physical space, but there's even, there, there's an emotional connection that might be even more important when you imagine. Uh, and I think that's, that is an important element of it is it's the role of imagination that is triggered when you are in a place where you know something historical happened, even if it's minor. You talk about being in Europe and, and the first time I was in Europe and going these back stairs up to a restaurant and the the marble stairs had been worn away from literally hundreds of years of people going up and down mm -hmm. those stairs and it, it wasn't that napoleon went up those stairs it's that for hundreds of years people have been going up and down up and down up and down and you could just felt it there was this yeah. this almost physical connection to this emotional like people have been here this long this building has been here this long and and there's something special about that my favorite of those is a place very near Liverpool Street Station, if you know Eastern London, there is, you know, down the street and hang a right is a place called the Jamaica Wine Bar, which was the Jamaica Coffee House in the 18th century. And it has exact, its, it's front stoop is exactly that. It's a piece of, of stone, I think it's granite, that has been worn down maybe five, six inches with, uh, you know, people going in to get, you know, their beverage. And it is among other things, a part of the world history of slavery because the ship's captains going in to get employed by a merchant to go to Jamaica to, to move enslaved Africans from from the from West Africa uh, across the, uh, the the Atlantic, you know. But it's this incredibly powerful space. You know, it's the fascination of of these 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 places you know that, that and to tell the complex story it's a very 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 complex story <clears throat> absolutely yeah. and and that the the complexity of that story um, I was downstairs when you were we, you were speaking earlier about just tell the story uh, and in all its complexity and and uh, and it doesn't require judgment it doesn't mean that and, and we of course want to be particularly um, uh, careful of that in applying our values backwards to something that happened in the 18th century but but we still need to understand it and we still need to look at it squarely and say this is the reality uh, of what happened. Let's talk Ben Franklin because ben, I do incessantly. You do. And Ben Franklin <laughs> is so incredibly important to Philadelphia, even though he's a Bostonian, which very few people seem to know. And I spent almost 20 years of my life living in Boston, um, having gone to school there. But he does. He abandons it as quickly as he can. He comes down to Philadelphia uh, and he makes his way in the world. And so much of particularly historic Philadelphia, it has this connection to Franklin. So we've mm -hmm. already mentioned a couple of the places, but tell us very quickly why Franklin's so important to Philadelphia. Well, he, you could almost argue that if he didn't found Philadelphia, but he certainly made it. He made it what it became and continued to impact it for centuries to follow. You know, he found Philadelphia a rather quiet Little riverside village, uh, a, a, a shipping port certainly, sending grains into the Atlantic world where they could be, you know, turned into bread that was would be eaten in London, um, or you know, cornmeal that would be served to enslaved workers in the Caribbean. But he looked at it, and this sort of uh, you can almost say it's a uh, something of a raw clay. It is a very diverse, almost if, if you could walk around 1720s Philadelphia, you'd be sort of freaked out. Because there were, as Stephanie Grauman Wolf, who wrote a great story about daily life in early America, a great book about daily life, said there would have been a cacophony of languages. It would have, you know, it might have, must have almost sounded like the parrot house at the zoo of people screaming in German dialects in various parts of the British Isles and, you know, Irish brogues. And of course, we don't know, but I surmise that African languages or accents being spoken of various, you know, of course, Africa is incredibly linguistically diverse, but all this going on, if you could walk through the market house that ran from second street West in Philadelphia, uh, you know, and you, you would hear all this, you know, he of course arrived on a quiet day. He arrived on a, on a Sunday morning on, on October 6, 1723, but still he found something that he wasn't expecting. He, first of all, found out that economically Philadelphia was a good place to be a poor guy. 
because bread was really cheap. He, mm. You know, 50 years later, he tells the story that he could buy good, fluffy white bread, you know, the high, you know, the, uh, the upper crust meal for next to nothing in Philadelphia. Um, and second of all, it was religiously diverse, and I would imagine that his Franklin, that Franklin's rather strict Puritan father and mother, who you know raised their children reading the Bible around the fire on Milk Street in Boston with Old South Meeting House across the street, found their teenage son and his dissenting beliefs somewhat disturbing. And I, you know, he has no record of his being beaten for his religious beliefs. But the Puritans, you know, Calvinists can be rather sticklers. And he comes to Philadelphia, and you know, he's he's a a writer and a printer, and he follows the crowd into what clearly is a religious structure at the corner of Second and Market. There's a bar there now. And he sits down and he waits for the sermon to begin because, of course, as a good boy from Puritan Boston, he knows you learn about the town by listening to uh, the preachers sermonize. And he went in and sat down, belly full of warm bread, and he had had a, a bunch of river water to drink and fell sound asleep, which <laughs> I, as I am a notorious napper, I'm with him, you know. And the Quakers, being a gentle people, let him sleep until the service was over. So the first place he ever slept was a Quaker meeting house. Fruitful ground for him and his ideas and his uh, thoughts about, about intellectual diversity and you know, he must have been a pleasant guy. Uh, one of the great writers of the 18th century English-speaking world is Dr. Samuel Johnson. Johnson talked about it being an era of clubbable men, mm. of folks who would go and sit down and have a pint and chat about ideas and the latest book and the latest magazine. Magazines are kind of a new invention. And maybe they're talking about the paintings that hang in Lord so-and-so's parlor that everybody's allowed to pay three pence and go and see on Saturdays or whatever. All these ideas are spreading and growing, and Franklin loved this. He travels to England very early on in his Philadelphia time, and he's enamored of this. And he comes back and just finds a, 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 everybody else is willing to join. He quickly founds his club called the Junto that meets every Friday in a room adjacent to a tavern, and they come, come up with rules that everybody has to follow and questions they have to answer, and they ha and they are required to pause after each one and take a sip of wine and and think. And I have, I've got to tell you, I've not read every document Franklin wrote, but I can tell you I very carefully attempted to follow the Junto questions and take a sip of wine afterwards. And that's a lot of wine. You're getting into 20, 30 sips of wine, and, you know, I, I don't know, I you know, how they got home safely, but they did. <laughs> um, but it, he was he was a person on the rise, and he was do doing very well, and the city was growing with him. And it's all built around this uh, th these Enlightenment ideals. Mm -hmm. It is the new intellect. It is what they call natural philosophy, but we, what we would call science. And they are curious. There is this intellectual curiosity, not only with Franklin, but with this group, these groups of people that he surrounds himself with. Mm -hmm. And so books become very important for this and they import them from London and, mm -hmm. and he founds the library company, right? Mm -hmm. And then after that, <clears throat> you have the American Philosophical Society that he is critical. And uh, the first time I visited there, uh, with the librarian, they were very kind to bring out some of the treasures. And one of them was this diary of, of Franklin's where in on the back page, he is testing inks f as a printer and, and looking at how they dry and, and trying to decide which one. And, and you could see where some were gray and, and some were more black and, and some absorbed into uh, the paper and some sat more on top of the paper. And so here is this mini experience experiment um you know mm -hmm. um, it wasn't mm -hmm. just oh there's black ink i'll take it well look, that's what we'll use on our printer uh, well, if you think about it in the 18th century if you wanted something somewhat out of the ordinary then it might take six months to get it and today we live in the era of amazon prime i probably shouldn't say that on a podcast because it's not they there. do not sponsor us it so. would be, it'd be if they want to send me a check for that i'll be glad to take it but they you know that we live in an era where there's never really any moment that you can't have exactly what you want 
And if you think about what it must have been like to shop in the 18th century, one of the great studies of this is George and Martha, George and Martha Washington, where I love that as you know he woos the widow Custis and he is he has made his move and they are getting ready and he, he's you know ordering nightgowns for her and you know debating the color of a lady's nightgown with the supplier in London and I'm like wow here's a bachelor who's trying to buy I don't know I imagine her nightgowns were not terribly risque but um you know this is constant discussion going on so to live in this transatlantic world of purchases was phenomenal. Um, and Franklin makes among his closest friends on people who were essentially doing his shopping in England. They all do. Some of this stuff is hilarious where, you know, the chief justice of Pennsylvania is writing to a supplier in England and a, describing Parmesan cheese and that he wants, and he wants this quality and it should taste, it should, and it should crumble this way. And, you know, he's had Parmesan cheese before when he was a student at Cambridge and he wants that kind of cheese now. <laughs> and you're like, good Lord, there are cows all over America. Can't you make your own cheese? But they weren't making nope. it. Nope. Um, so Franklin becomes this instrumental figure. The Enlightenment is is driving him and others like him. Um, so sort of walk us through um, how that sort of becomes this incredible moment that uh, becomes 1776 and, and what is happening. Well, that, that would take about 20 years or, or, or so to really go through with it. But Philadelphia becomes... Uh, the largest city in British North America, and certainly in a lot of ways uh, the most complex. It, it's interesting to read, as I did when I was writing Independence, the letters and diaries of congressmen from other colonies who are coming here. And some are amazed. They are absolutely gobsmacked by what they uh, discover. And some are like, oh, God, really? This is your state house? It's kind of boring, and the paneling is pretty plain. And what do you mean? You know, uh, you, know you can't see Independence Hall on a tall hill overlooking the city. It's very plainly placed, uh, you know, on a city lot. Uh, and so some of them are not terribly impressed with that. Um, you know, for, but the city does quickly get a reputation as being sophisticated and intellectual. Uh, the Library Company, the Philosophical Society. Uh, in 1749, Franklin calls for the creation of uh, a non-denominational college that becomes what we now call the University of Pennsylvania. It is a school that allows poor kids to come and study. If you really wanted to get into the educated enlightened of the town, Quaker leaders like Anthony Benezet create schools where they're teaching young black children and young female children more than just you know, how to plant a rose garden or, you know, how to, uh, you know, uh, how to serve tea. Uh, and so a lot of this plays into it that, you know, it is a place where there are things to study, things to do, things to discuss. And so all that's going to play very much, you know, into eventually Philadelphia being called the Athens of America. It's it's something very different than you're going to see. And, and the other thing, frankly, is Philadelphia came through the era of almost nonstop warfare from, that stretched from the 1680s to the 1760s, where communities, New England communities, are being devastated by, you know, one generation after another of men getting killed in battle. And because of Philadelphia's connection to Quakerism, we never got as into it. There were upheaval here, and there was um, eventually Franklin helped found the militia to protect uh, the city. But we never lost the numbers that other colonies did. And so our common economy didn't s struggle as much. So when, you know, again, one of my favorites is John Adams getting here and just saying, he writes home to Abigail and says, oh, my God, they're going to kill us with kindness. <laughs> you, you go to a home and they serve turkey and roast beef and chicken and all these different types of wines and all these desserts. And you're like, oh, John, you're going to end up with gout, you know, day. You, you got to pull back and have a glass of water. Which, of course, Franklin does get. Oh, and by the end of his life, he's that got famous sedan chair. Yeah. You know, he does walk, but he does, the gout is miserable. And he actually writes some dialogues between himself and the dreaded gout. And 
you know, feels like somebody's biting down on his toe, which it must be a miserable, mm. miserable thing to go through. Yeah. So the Athens of America, there are architectural movements, there are artistic movements. Charles Wilson Peel, you write about in Independence, you know, becomes, even though he's from Bal uh, from Baltimore and then Annapolis, but uh, it is Philadelphia where he becomes one of the great American artists who records uh, that earliest American history and, and mm -hmm. those players, both major and minor. Tell us a little bit about Charles Wilson Peel. He's fascinating because he is essentially a self-trained artist who does uh, finally spent some time in London uh, working in proximity to Benjamin West, who was a great uh, self-taught. And then eventually he went on to Europe and studied European art and became a very important painter in uh, the, in Georgian London. But Peel is fascinating because he has, he's almost like, you know, Franklin's non-biological son. He has this expansive view of learning and thinks he can capture it all, that the world is surmountable and we can understand it. And Peel, you know, his mind was always expansive. He, he believed very strongly in portraiture, but he began collecting natural science artifacts at points in you know, this house with all of his bizarrely named children. He named all of his kids after either founding fathers or famous artists. So... Little Titian and little Rembrandt running around the house, and you know, playing with, with little Benjamin Franklin Peel. And you know, at one point, he kept a bald eagle in the residence with them. Um, <laughs> he helped observe uh, the excavation of a mastodon, and you know, the mastodon was. A big, and I, this is not my first research. This is I'm copying off others, but the mastodon is something that doesn't make sense because what happened? to these things. Why aren't they wandering the streets of Pennsylvania anymore? And of course, they didn't comprehend extinction. They didn't right. know the dinosaurs had existed yet. Right. So they're doing this. And at one point, Peel gets a mastodon skeleton and puts it together. And in, it's quite hilarious because he thought the tusks were giant teeth and that they were carnivores. So the, the early pictures he printed of them. But um, someone, some museum in Europe uh, actually owns his mastodon skeleton. I'm trying to remember where it is. You'll have to look that up and and tag this into your broadcast. But, you know, it is, it, they had this idea that all knowledge was was collectible. Right. And that's, and, and we still see that to this day with the American Philosophical Society, mm -hmm. where it's so interesting because uh, they're, they're members who are very limited. There's I, uh, just under a thousand, I think at the moment, and they are from history and political science. I, I was lucky enough to be invited uh, by uh, a friend and, and uh, actually former guest of, uh, of this podcast, uh, who was inducted as a political scientist uh, on the same day that Elena Kagan, the Supreme Court justice, was inducted? But then they're all. But then so many of their members are these hardcore scientists mm -hmm. who are doing real hard science. And but in this one organization founded by Franklin, you still have this enlightenment idea of natural philosophy, where yeah. history, politics, science, you know, chemistry and all of it is all under the same roof. Yep. And they still do phenomenal work. Yes. I, I, I don't know. Um, I read recently the number of scholarly grants they give. So they make it possible for kids like me to, you know, to come uh, to do a month's research. And I, I will always think uh, the, the former librarian, a man named Mar Marty Levitt, was giving us our uh, the vault tour when we first arrived and handed me a uh, uh, a framed piece of paper mm -hmm. and said, do you know what this is? And I said, it's a framed piece of paper. Uh, it's a piece of paper under glass. And he said, can you tell me anything about it? And I started to read it and it began with when in the course of human events it becomes necessary. And, then I no, said, and were there notes in the margin? There are. There are notes in the margin. And, and uh, tell I, us who uh, they're written by. They're written, it's, well, I, he said, well, do you recognize anything about it? I said, well, it's the Declaration of Independence. He said, what else can you tell me? I said, it's Thomas Jefferson's handwriting. <laughs> and he said, very good. And I, I said, most people don't get that. And I said, well, I've seen Thomas Jefferson handwriting before. Yeah. But it is this, you know, it, it, I think it's very emblematic of the APS that no one with the possible exception of their brilliant library staff has any real grasp of what's in those buildings. Right. Absolutely. That there's just... Yeah. so much yeah. and they're still finding it you know yeah. one of the things they've been working on is digitizing deborah reed franklin's 
uh, shop account books because Mrs. Franklin ran the business while he was running the printing press. And um, Franklin, you know, very quickly, even though he is not a person by any means of the elite, he, be he begins to see himself as a public facing person. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of that is when he creates the Library Company of Philadelphia, one of the first things he does is he donates his printer services. So he's now a philanthropist. He's a businessman giving to very publicly to charity. So they have all the printed forms they need and such. And it's kind of a big deal. And it's it's his wife who in in some ways makes makes that possible because she continues mm -hmm. to run the business. And and the reason I, I I find that so fascinating is the other part of your work, of your scholarship. Um, in addition to talking about historical place, has been about giving voice to those in American history who are uh, have not always had a voice. And so uh, looking at women, looking at uh, enslaved people, looking at lower classes, uh, and making sure we understand and hear their stories in addition to, and that's to me one of the more important things is, you're not saying we don't need to hear those other stories anymore. We need to hear all these new stories. You're saying that there's always room for more stories and that we need to hear all of the stories that we can hear. So as you've heard, may, may have heard me say to the group of teachers, I don't really look at history as like dessert. You know, if you get a bigger piece of history, of your history, that means I get less of, of, of my, for, uh, for mine. We all have our histories. And I think ignoring any of them is perilous. And I'll go so far as to say un-American. We've been a complex people since the day we started crawling off the boats, probably seasick as hell. And uh, I certainly, I, I, I've dabbled in DNA and some research, and you've, I found some ancestors I was quite shocked to find, but, you know, there they are. Um, and I, I think it, we are a complex people. If you look at the current Congress, I hope, or, you know, the diversity of the Supreme Court now that we've never had uh, one this divorce, uh, it, that's, with, well, that's a complex story right there. Or if you look at where a successful campaign goes on uh, politically, I think that's vastly important. So Phyllis Wheatley and uh, Ona Judge uh, were two of the names that immediately uh, jumped out at me. Phyllis Wheatley, again, because I'm uh, having you know spent so much mm -hmm. time in Boston and in the Museum of the American Revolution here in Philadelphia, they have a first edition uh, of that volume of poetry yeah. that, that she wrote uh, in honor of George Washington. So that was really interesting. But I want you to tell us about your essay and about Ona Judge, because she is a, a fascinating story um, that is this direct connection because uh, she was in George Washington's household. She was, yeah. I mean, I wanted very much to get someone to write an essay on the enslaved women of the presidential household in Philadelphia. Um, and one of the people, the one of, one of the natural choices to do that was Erica Dunbar, who wrote the phenomenal um, book Never Caught, and there's now a, a young person's edition of the, to that too. But Professor Dunbar was busy with other things, including she's now a producer of the TV show The Gilded Age. Mm. Uh, so um, Erica, Erica was busy. And I asked uh, around several people, and of course, you know, as you do in academe, does anybody know anybody working on this topic? And the answer I kept getting was, well, why don't you do it? You covered some of this in your book, Independence. And I'm like, well, I guess I could. I was incredibly fortunate. I'm a longtime volunteer with the National Park Service. And I was permitted to use park archives, is permitted, provided I sat alone in a room by myself, not breathing on an NPS employee in the height of the COVID, uh, and was able to go through papers. Um, the park's now retired historian, Anna Cox Tugut, a woman who we call Coxie, had created a great archive of documents related to the enslaved community and this house. And as I looked at this, I was trying to find... Uh, uh, an angle, you know, Erica Dunbar has already published a great book as a biography. Um, I was in the process at that point of nominating Ona Judge for a state historical marker, which will be going up in the next year sometime, and trying to think of, you know, how to do this. And I went back, to, you know, our teachers used to tell us, go back to the primary source and looked for Ona's voice. And Ona said to me in print, 
you know, when they explain, how did you get away? How did you, how did you, how do you escape from the home of the president of the United States of America? This guy who's the commander in chief of the army and Navy. And she explains that she quote, I had friends among the colored people of the town. And she, you know, if you think about that experience, if you know Mount Vernon now, you know, it's still very rural. You know, if you want to go to get a sandwich or, you know, to go to fill up your car with gas or, you know, it's, it's, it's a schlep. It's a, it's a walk. Town is a, a heck of a drive. So Ona is taken from this world that she is born into at Mount Vernon and transplanted into two northeastern urban cities. And in the second of those, where the Washington household mo uh, moves in 1790, suddenly she is surrounded by an African-American community that is in, in the process of gaining freedom. The, the, the story of abolition in Philadelphia would be would take more time than we have today. But uh, the, the, this community is, is rising, is coming about, and she becomes friendly with some of these folks. And some, I mean, we don't know for certain, but we can surmise either helped her out the back door of the president's house or hid her in basements or in attics or in you know coach houses and got her on a ship and got her out of Pennsylvania. And she remained, as she said, forever free. You know, there's the number of documents we have of Af by African-American women are so few. Mm -hmm. But the fact that she leaves us two autobiographical interviews is uh, amazing. And I'll tell you, that was I think the success of that was, in part uh, building on what I did with Independence and having access to the Park Service's archive of primary sources, I could walk the streets of Philadelphia and tell you where other people who own a might or likely knew lived and their story of couples who had gained freedom of couples who had bought a house, you know, and doing this, you know, one of the, the challenges that, that I, I the, the essay fails on, uh, I really wanted to juxtapose Ona's later life in freedom mm -hmm. with a woman who we only know by the name Mal, um, the Custis children, Martha's grandchildren, called her Mammy Mal, Mal, but Mammy is an incredibly loaded term in modern America. But she was this beloved, almost stereotypical caregiver mm -hmm. who, you know, the children talk about, you know, she cuddled us and dried our tears and she was, you know, she raised Martha Washington's children for her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Mal vanishes. We just can't. I, you know, I hope someone listening to this will be the one to call me and say, oh, we found her. Um, one hypothesis is that after Martha died in 1802, Mal was inherited by one of the grandsons-in-law and went to be with him. But, you know, it's this astounding thing when you realize these people who, you know, this, this woman was in the presidential household for its first eight years, and then she vanishes. We don't know what happened to her. And so often, especially as I've got, gotten to know more and more about the Washington family and their enslaved workers, you know, the, the, the idea that people just can vanish from the historical record seems almost nonsensical. So there's a lot of history out there to do. There's no point I've, I can reason yet on why we ever stop looking. You know, I am so proud of my friends and colleagues at Mount Vernon and at Thomas Jefferson's Monticello, and at James and Dolly Madison's uh, Montpelier, and others who have broken through the stone walls and start telling these stories. And one of the things that I, you know, I, I have spent a lot of time studying what folks used to inherit because I'm trying to figure out how this painting got from point A to point Z, or why is this chest of drawers where it ends up? But it's really mind-boggling when you start to see people being inherited in the same way. Mm -hmm. Martha intended to give Ona Judge to a granddaughter as a wedding present. And everybody, including this granddaughter's eventual husband, thought she was just a nasty piece of work. And Ona didn't want to go. You know, she she had seen freedom. She'd been given that taste. And 
she declared independence. I, I think I wrote this in Women of Washington, Women in Washington's World. She declared her own independence a block from where the declaration had been been proclaimed. Right. She and I think about her, little, young, defenseless, but stepping into a community. The reality was Ona could walk out of the front door of 190 High Street. I don't know if she used the front door or not. I like to think she did. And encounter African-American women who had gone from slavery to freedom and now were making the things of freedom, families, financial success, homes. And I think that's vastly important, you know, um, it's not something when I was a third grader they taught me. Right. But we got a lot of work to do. And I like to think, you know, uh, since, you know, our internet connection when I was in third grade was really bad. <laughs> but that's gotten better. If we can change in that way, we can change history too. Absolutely. So I want to, we like to have at least a brief discussion about uh, what we call America today. So as someone who studied that era, I'm curious what lessons you think early America holds for us today in a world where Americans are having a harder and harder time talking to one another because they don't agree about stuff or because their own experience is just so vastly different. They don't see anything in common with other people. I, mean, I think we have to learn from the past. You know, I, I think about the number of times I've watched people get emotional over the history that I write. I've seen that so often. I will always remember taking my NEH teacher's workshop to the Library Company of Philadelphia and their wonderful, unemotional librarian, James Green, who is now retired but is a, is a brilliant historian of Franklin's era and his printed works. Um, Jim was, and Jim was a very quiet, very mild-mannered fellow, and he was describing things. And one of the teachers was standing, facing a, a brick wall, weeping. And I went up to this lady and said, "If you need something, please let me know. But I'm a little rattled, so can you tell me what's going on?" And she turned to me and was just in tears, and she said, "George, I've taught AP government in Ohio for my entire career." And you just let me see a rough printed draft of the Constitution with James Wilson's margin notes on it. Do you know what this means to me? And I said, you know, you don't normally get to get a librarian emotional. But I said, I think we need to tell Mr. Green how you're feeling. And she did. And he he, he teared up, too. And we're all, you know, it's it's like a Walton family you know, Christmas special. We're all in tears. But it does mean something. What scares me, there's this idea of late that in order for you to have, I can't. Mm -hmm. If you have a history, mm -hmm. you know, if somehow you have that, then somehow I won't. And that's kind of nuts. The, the zero sum game. Yeah. That if, if, you, if you win, I have to lose. And if I win, you have to lose. As opposed to, one, just allowing history to be history. What happened, happened. I think as a, as a teacher, uh, it, it's always that I used to say to uh, when I was a dean of students to, to young teachers uh, and, and teaching high school. I'm like, they're adolescents. Their job is to make mistakes, to screw up. Our job is to help them understand it. And I think teaching history is the same way. It's that the facts are the facts. What happened, happened. What we need to do is figure out what do we learn from it? How do we understand it? How do we make meaning from it? Yeah. And it doesn't have to be, I think you make a really important point. It doesn't have to be, oh, you are a terrible person because you're related to this person who we today a judge did something terrible. Okay, we like to close with a quiz because uh -oh. this has been deep and there uh -oh. have been tears, oh, yeah, and yeah. Uh, we want to we want to make sure that uh, Georgia to museum. There's gonna, somebody's <laughs> going to be crying over something. Okay, just bear in mind, folks. I'm old. I haven't taken a quiz since the '80s. <laughs> So uh, question number one, excluding Washington and Lincoln, uh, who is your favorite president? Franklin Roosevelt. Okay. Uh, what's one book you would recommend for listeners to pick up and read? Oh, wow. I, I could give you piles of them. Um, pick your favorite. 
Wow. Um, Reese Isaac's Transformation of Virginia. We talked about that earlier. Or my dear friend Judy Van Buskirk's brilliant book, uh, Generous Enemies, about the revolution in New York City. That's a that's another phenomenal book. Excellent. I have a lot of friends who publish, so yeah. I may have just yeah. gotten myself into some <laughs> <laughs> We'll pass on all the emails. Uh, if you had not chosen a career as a historian, what might you have become? Oh, golly. Uh, I don't know. Um, maybe I would have gone into cooking. Uh, I like to cook. Uh, okay. Uh, or, or gardening, although I don't get to do that as much as I'd like to. But uh. Excellent. Uh, what pet peeve annoys you the most? Oh, people who lie about history and somehow consider that patriotic. Oh, that was deep. Sorry. Uh, what's your favorite movie? Honestly? Oh, my. Um, gut reaction? It's a Wonderful Life. Okay, fair um, enough. High up there would also be my father's favorite movie uh, called The Best Years of Our Lives, mm -hmm. which is covers uh, – which everyone – anybody who had a dad who fought in World War II should see yeah. annually. Yeah. But it, I always said it's the story of my father who came back and became a builder after yep. after defeating Hitler. Yep. That's yeah. That's that's the story of that movie, and yeah. and yeah, it's that greatest generation story. They yeah. did their, they did what they needed to do, and then they came home and went yeah. back to a normal life. Uh, if you could meet just one historical person, who would it be? Oh boy, there's lots of them. Just for the pleasantry of the company, I'd love to have met Eleanor Roosevelt. I admired her greatly as a child, and still do. I've wept at her grave. Um, if I could have an hour with Benjamin Franklin, it would answer a lot of research questions. <laughs> it would really, I, you know, I have a lot of stuff I need to know, and that would, you know, uh, who was William's mother, you know. Uh, but So can I use those two? Sure, uh, absolutely. Okay. We'll let you do two. Uh, and final question, and we ask this same question of everybody, bourbon or scotch? Bourbon. Excellent. Bourbon's winning. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. My, my grandmother was a scotch drinker. I always thought it tasted like peat, like peat you would put around a plant. Yeah. Um, and I have been well blessed to do several uh, historic research trips to Charleston, and I strongly recommend, they're not paying me to say this, but go to Husk, drink bourbon at the bar. Oh, the, the food, their bar food is unbelievably good. And Charleston, you just, everybody should go there and eat yeah. and then see the new yeah. museum. Yeah. Uh, yes, Husk is amazing. Um, and there's now one in Nashville. Mm. And uh, yeah, they, they do amazing stuff. I, I, I enjoyed it very much there. And this concludes this episode of George Washington Slept Here. George Boudreau, thank you for a wonderful conversation. Mm. I also want to thank our producers, Lar Kennedy and Sarah Rasmussen. A special shout out to a uh, friend of the pod, Bill Franz, for his art design work on the logo. Special thanks to longtime Freedom's Foundation historic interpreter Bob Gleason for his contributions to to the intro music and most of all i want to thank you our listeners please subscribe follow rate and review george washington slept here wherever you listen to your podcasts and, and tell your friends if you want to learn more about freedoms foundation check our website at www.freedomsfoundation.org and follow us on social media instagram and facebook at freedoms foundation and fffvf uh, on twitter and you can email us once again at gwshpodcast at gmail.com with comments, questions, or suggestions. Thanks, and talk to you next time.